Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition, episode, whatever you want to call it, of Common Objections to Voluntarism. This is episode three, I believe. Uh, we're going to keep going until we run out of questions. Uh, today, I'm joined with some of the founding members of the Seeds of Liberty podcast, Jeremy and Danilo. Uh, hey, guys. Howdy. Hey. Um, the way we do this is I give you guys... Uh, uh, someone can talk on it, the main point, and then someone can rebut or say anything, you know, maybe add to the thing, and I'll chime in like a annoying person. So, <laughs> um, first question on today's uh, docket is, but what would people use for money? Gold is just inferior to paper money. Danilo, I know you're going to love this question, so I'm going let to let you go first. <laughs> Well, I think um, w when I look at um, currency, there's um, there's forced currency and then there's natural currency. I don't know if uh, if I read that somewhere, or I came up with that my own conclusion. But you know, natural currency would be what people voluntarily choose to use because you know, as a as a society, people just choose to use certain things as they're available. You know, due to their scarcity and portability and durability and fungibility and things like that. Um, you know, and that and that would include like you know spices and. Um, you know, copper, gold, silver, lumber, you know, exotic bird feathers, seashells, different things like that. So, and, and they, they come and go for various reasons, right? But then you have forced currency, which would be every, anything that's done by fiat, right? Uh, by governments forced upon the population and given legal tender status and oftentimes monopoly status in that anybody who attempts to compete with the forced currency or the fiat currency um, is immediately, um, you know, uh, you know, re reprimanded, subjected to punishment, and uh, imprisoned, most likely. So, <laughs> so, so, so the only reason right now that we use fiat currency is because it's forced on the population, right? People would not, people would not willingly choose to use a currency that loses its purchasing power, <laughs> you know. Um, progressively every single day that you hold it, right? <laughs> For uh, sure. And, and also that that a small group of people control in you know in a fascistic way, um, you know that just doesn't make sense. Why would you want to hold something that's just that's just deteriorating in your hand? It doesn't make sense. But the only reason that people don't understand what gold is is because you know it's been well. First of all, it was outlawed in 1933. And then, and then people, you know, over time, just you know, you just get used to using paper currency, and then, you know, and then after a while, it kind of fades away into into oblivion, and, and you know, people are like, what's gold? You know, gold is just for jewelry. You know, why would we want to use it? <laughs> it's clunky. It's heavy. Why would you want to do that? It's just so easy to use paper. You know, <laughs> and 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 then people think, you know, because it's like, you know, it's backed by the by the U.S. government. That's what gives it value. You know, that's what a lot of I get that a lot, and. And I say, no, that's not true. You know, you, people have people make things of value and 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 people value them because they choose to use it. Right. Like Bitcoin. Like what is backed by Bitcoin? Absolutely nothing. Cryptocurrency. Right? That's yeah. it. Or cri but, it's its ability to be. It's backed by nothing, really. Yeah. Like no gold, no precious metals, no, you know, nothing. But its value is in the 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 qualities it has of being yeah a, a cryptocurrency easy easy to be uh, transported you know to any you know it's just easy to be accessed um, also very divisible um, fungible and all the kind of stuff so um, so it's really people's willingness to use something is what gives it value basically I guess the subjective theory of value so I can go on but yeah what what, <laughs> what, what, did, Jeremy. <laughs> what did what did Elon Elon Musk say he was like well, just went to the Mexican border with with 5.2 million watching someone's five thousand dollars get seized <laughs> but uh yeah um the uh the idea that uh fiat is somewhat better than gold uh, or or any kind of paper currency that's issued on behalf of gold is better than the gold itself is kind of a ludicrous idea in my opinion but people have been trained and indoctrinated and propagandized to believe that you know, paper money is good. You know, like uh, I guarantee you, if I had a hundred million dollars worth of paper money in a suitcase versus a hundred million dollars worth of gold, that person's going to take that paper money. Yeah. Because yeah, exactly. they see that as real wealth. Exactly. And <clears throat> it's you've got to break down that wall first before you can even consider talking to them about why paper money is just ridiculous and you know every bit of 
bond or or any kind of currency that is created by a government is just usually funded on the death of thousands and thousands of people through wars. Uh, Jeremy, anything to add to Danilo, what Danilo said? Sure. Uh, to address the what would we use in, in uh, question, in, in you know specifically the gold versus paper money is actually uh, t takes away from from that question because it's not necessarily you know that's saying like that's the only other option. But you know what would we you what would we use is you know we don't we don't really know the answer to that. Um, the whole idea of you know stuff like the the three of us advocate for is that. Yeah, you, know, you allow for the free market of money to take over, and instead of having that monopoly that Danilo mentioned, um, where it's only you know that's that's because of the legal tender laws, that's the only thing that's readily exchanged and what people believe. Uh, instead, you open it up to the possibility of things like Bitcoin, other cryptocurrencies, precious metals can be used more often, but you know anything because as we've dis as we discussed in our our episode about about money on the Seeds of Liberty podcast. The uh, the history is that so many different things have been used for currency and and or money you know over the years that uh, when government isn't in the way and, and having that monopoly on it and forcing other options out of the market the uh, the choice you know the potential is unlimited. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, anything way. could be currency. Yeah. Well, exactly. So, but to you know, like I said, to answer the question specifically, that's one of those things that that. You know, a lot of status will will say is is a cop out, but it's it's really not because we don't actually really have to answer that question. <laughs> what will we use? Well, again, what are we using now, and why why is that the only thing? You 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 know you make the choices unlimited, and uh, the market will determine what becomes the most readily used. Um, and even then, you you still most likely won't be tied to one. Um, there still might be multiple ones that. A good number of people, even here, like say, and on this one particular patch of dirt uh, that most people refer to you as the as the United States, there could be multiple ones that work alongside of each other, and that you know, it's, like I yeah, said, we, we don't we don't actually have to answer that question because that goes back to the you know who would pick the cotton thing. That's a, we, that's a false dichotomy, right? That if the government doesn't issue the money, we're not going to have currency. <laughs> exactly, it's a false it's a false dichotomy. It's not. Okay. It's not either or, and it'll be a matter of whatever the market sh shows that uh, will work best. That's what it'll be. But you know, because we don't have to pick it, we just have to know what's going on now is wrong. <laughs> is wrong, <laughs> and people people's real wealth is being stolen from them. The uh, the the answer to this question is: What will we use for money? What we'll use for money, whatever someone will take as money. Mm -hmm. That's that's plain and simple. That's the answer. Whatever people will accept as payment for a debt. So, um, but, we're gonna but, move. But before we go on, let me just do, give two observations. One, I just like to note what people's conception of gold and silver is. Like, if if uh, if a mug, if somebody were to mug someone, and then that person has a hundred dollar bill or a hundred ounce silver bar, <laughs> which one do you think they would take? <laughs> <laughs> Hundred dollar bill. Exactly, and the same thing in movies. Most most Hollywood movies that feature a heist of a bank, are they are they most often stealing gold and silver, or are they most often stealing paper? <laughs> I think that's an accurate. Well, it's reflection. not even paper. The, the The United States dollar is printed on printed on cotton. Yeah, <laughs> actually, it's it's worth less than paper because uh, because you know before it was printed, it had a use, right? But now it's printed, it's, it's worthless. Yeah. <laughs> So next question up is going straight to Jeremy. But who would protect our food? Who would ban GMOs, the evil scientists, messing up our our food, killing the bees? Who would do it, Jeremy? Well, the answer to most of these questions, uh, as I've said in a previous episode, is usually you ask yourself, well, who's doing it now? Right now, there is one entity. Uh, the FDA is supposed to be in charge of stuff like that. And with government, as we've seen, with the uh, fascistic nature, uh, the uh, Monsanto, who is currently the cream of the crop, as it were, in the uh, GMO world, <laughs> uh, has legislation designed specifically for it, it uh, to protect them from being... The Monsanto pro Protection Bill? Yeah, yeah, that's the yeah. this, that's the that, that's the uh, if, term if, for it. Yes. If that's not if that's not the most clear cut case of 
freaking <laughs> fascism I've ever heard in my entire life. Well, exactly. Monsanto is too big to fail. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's that's what I was getting at. I, I've done research, but you know, there's there's still no way to tell really about GMOs. Uh, you know, but why do you need one entity to f supposedly enforce rules about it? Because you know, a lot of the states are always trying to get you know labeling laws put in place. Um, when instead you could allow the free market to handle that because there are companies out there that have already voluntarily started, you know, marking their products non-GMO. Um, didn't take any special legislation that, for them to do that. Everybody's going to be GMO haters until they make a weed that can't be traced by a, uh, make, make mar a marijuana that can't be traced by a drug test. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then they're yeah. going to be like, GMOs are the best! <laughs> Well, I, I'm sure for a lot of people that are that are supposedly anti, you know, with, with a lot of those movements, that a, a good portion of the people don't actually know why. They're just following whatever they hear and the rhetoric. So they, they may be easily swayed, of course, if something comes along that, that you know, benefits them, then they may easily change their mind. But I, I don't think that, again, just having the one entity. So who would do it? Again, you, you open up the market. If, if there's a demand for that, there will be, you know, you could have... Uh, food inspectors, you could have, you know, yeah, restaurants and 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 uh, f grocery stores are going to want to have that. Hey, this institution that's got a five star rating inspects all of our food, uh, and all the farmers are going to want that on their stuff too. Like, it's kind of crazy to think that Consumer Reports and the free market aren't going to destroy any kind of stuff that people. I mean, we've already seen what happens when someone tweets, "Hey, you know, Burger King, I found a band aid in my Burger King." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Burger King flips out, you know, and and it's the it's the end of the world and all that, and it's everyone knows about it the next day. So if if somebody's making a GMO or they're they're doing some crazy stuff with our food, without government protection, they're going to go out of business. And on top of all that, banning uh, it just never works in the first place. You know, that's just another 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 way of of saying prohibition. And, and that always backfires because when a government bans something, uh, you know, they enforce that with, you know, the initiation of aggression at all times with the with the enforcement agents. Um, but it ends up protecting the companies, like in this case, a Monsanto, um, or it protects the preferred interest. So any regulations that the people think are in their favor are actually benefiting the companies that that they supposedly hate. Um, so that's just the vicious cycle that goes on when, when government gets involved in trying to ban things. So there's no need to ban GMOs. Um, if people would trust the, the science that they come across and if it ends up panning out that they're, they end up being horrible, then yes, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty positive that people will, will, will band together <laughs> even in a free society and yeah, decide that it's not, it's, not, it's not worth it for them. Uh, and and they want they want to make sure they're gone, um, but it's it, it's a it's a matter of choice. And if people want to believe they're good and they want to continue eating them, they should be allowed to. There's no reason they should be banned, because um, that's another one of those things that on, on both sides you'll hear that is settled science. But uh, <laughs> I I think it seems to be far from settled, at least from my end. Uh, so, you know, the ban banning is just unnecessary. But well, who, you have who would take... so many people with uh, agendas hidden, you know, pushing their so many people yeah. agendas are pushing their, you know, their idea on the whole thing, and they're not, uh, they're not looking at it rationally. Well, that's the case with most problems with status, but yeah. So, like, like I said, basically, who who would do it? Uh, there would be there would be private agencies that that could compete and uh, provide these services because, as you said, Dave, co companies or or food producers are are going to want to make their their customers happy. And how do you do that in most cases by providing as much information as possible so they can make informed decisions um, so it is as it as it always is it's to their benefit to want these things and push to have these things so it could very easily happen in a free society where um, the, the the farmers and, and, the, and the store owners and all the and the restaurants could be the ones leading the charge to have them implemented um, they've got so, to meet the market demand you know mm -hmm, exactly so, so I, I came into this, this topic um, initially before I actually started studying volunteerism because 
<clears throat> I, I studied um, acupuncture, Chinese herbs, and Eastern nutrition. So I read a lot about this stuff about GMOs, you know, about um, you know all the chemicals and herbicides and fungicides that they add. And I'm like, you know, that's horrible. There needs to be laws. <laughs> you know, I was thinking that. And then and um, and then later on, you know, you know, I, I learned more about the marketplace and economics and the nature of government and what banning actually does. And like you said, Jeremy, it, you know, when you ban something, you are expanding state power, and um, you're decreasing, you know, the freedom of of the business owners to to interact with the customer, right? Um, by by the threat of violence, right? And that never never turns out t turns out well. And you know, I, I always get people tell me, you know, but look at Europe. They ban GMOs. Isn't that wonderful? We should ban them here too. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, like you said, banning never solves anything. You know, if people really want something, they're going to go to the black market and get it. There's a, either either they go to the black market, or or the 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 effect that, like you said, all these regulations have is in stifling new competition at the expense of the in, entrenched um, special interest groups that have their political connections and the, you know uh, you know army of lobbyists and. And, and you know bribes <laughs> that they can shower on the politicians. So so and, and actually I um, I interviewed this guy Andrew Demeter uh, from Teen Tag recently, and he did an interesting uh, recent video on. He interviewed the guy who I think started the first non-GMO restaurant in um, Ohio City, I think it was, and and I thought that's a wonderful thing. Like again, like you said, Jeremy, no law forced him to do that, right? He responded to market demand. There there are people out there who want to eat non-GMO stuff, right? And he's catering to that demand, and that's wonderful. That's that's how things will work out, is businesses will, they, they um, you know, like like uh, w what people want, their desires, their needs, their their wants, it's always shifting, right? And it's it's to the, it's it's on the business owner to figure out what do the people want? How can I satisfy them the best? And that's how you become wealthy. That's how you. That's how you make a successful business, and that's how Steve Jobs made a successful business, right? Well, that uh, and state help, but yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, but but, um, but again, I mean, I mean, nobody. I, you know, you, you you can say like let, let's say like Walmart, right? Receives all these tax breaks and and subsidies, and and uh, and let's say let's say Steve Jobs received all these tax breaks and subsidies, but still, nobody is forcing us to buy an iPad. Nobody's forcing us to shop at Walmart, right? <laughs> or even even Chase or Bank of America. How fascistic they are nobody is really we're not really forced to go to chase we can you know it would be more difficult to live off the grid you know through bitcoin or whatever but we are not essentially forced to use it right it's a little bit different than saying the federal reserve you can only use u.s currency anything else is outlawed right so it's not outlawed not to go to chase or walmart or you know those other things but um but yeah so there, there is still a choice there yeah, I mean, so, yeah. I look at it as a marketplace solution thing. I mean, look at Chiquita Bananas, right? Chiquita Bananas, the bananas that they make are GMO bananas. The banana that you buy on the shelf from Chiquita is does not exist in nature, all right? Mm -hmm. those, those actually can't even reproduce. They have to plant each one. It's not like there's a banana forest and they just keep doing it. Once that thing makes bananas, it dies off. As soon as, if that tree gets cut down, it, you couldn't plant a Chiquita, a Chiquita banana tree or yeah in the middle of the forest and then come back 10 years later and have 10,000 Chiquita banana trees around there would just build, still be that one it can't propagate itself so obviously people are buying the shit out of bananas because they keep sending them here so <laughs> if people were like no this is a GMO we don't want that they would either have to adapt or die and that's what we like you know that's why people call us uh, uh, market Darwinist or whatever <laughs> uh, whatever the, the thing they try to say is an evil thing it's like why wouldn't you want the best to survive and let the dying die you know if you're not doing with the market what people want then why should you exist um, okay we're gonna move on to the uh, the next question which is uh, kind of a good one how would criminals be dealt with uh, Danilo goes first on this uh, how would criminals be dealt with? Well, <laughs> well, I think the first thing to consider is what what makes a criminal. And I think one of my one of my favorite uh, um, quotes is by Tacitus, is a is a Roman scholar. He said the the more the more laws, the more corrupt the state. 
right? And also Lao Tzu, he says, the, the more laws, the more criminals, right? <laughs> so it's kind of a, an interesting thing is that, you know, what, what makes a criminal in, in our current society of so many, you know, thousands of pages of federal regulations and laws and taxes, there is actually no way to avoid breaking some insignificant law, right? There was a, there was a book, Harvey Silverglate. Um, I have yet to read it, but I'm, I'm dying to read it. It's called um, um, uh, Three Felonies a Day. Like every American breaks three um, commits three felonies a day for the very reason that there is such a monumental amount of laws on the books already, and there's more <laughs> coming out each day, that uh, it is impossible for people to not break the law. <laughs> and, and it's kind of interesting that, like, and, and, you know, I talk about something simple, like, like, um, like you know, speed limits. How many people break the speed? Speed limits 55 miles an hour on a regular highway. Does anybody drive less than 55 miles an hour on a highway? No. Yeah. So then, what's the purpose of the law? Well, actually, people do, especially here on Long Island. There's a lot of people who like who like to travel the left and sometimes the middle lane at 45. But yeah, on on the on the whole, on the whole, I, on the whole, I do, I would agree. Most people yeah, I'll be, go uh, over it. The the interstate beside my house, <clears throat> or that I get off on. There's like a five mile strip that 70 miles is the posted limit, and I've ne I've lived here my whole life. I've never seen a cop there, and everyone drives about 100 or, <laughs> or 80, 85, 90 miles an hour for that for that chunk of road, because no accidents ever happen there. I guess so. If there was accidents happening there, they put police officers there. So yeah. I you know. If you try driving the speed limit on the interstate, people are gonna get pissed off at you. Cause, <laughs> no, like, uh, there's construction damn, right. What's wrong with you? <laughs> there's construction right beside my house that's like 55 degree, uh, 55 miles an hour. If I've actually tried to drive 55 miles an hour, and like state troopers pass me, flicking me off. Like, what the fuck are you doing, bro? <laughs> 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 like, speed, push the gas pedal. No, no. But uh, what about the, you know, the in my opinion, no victim, no crime. So, like. The people that steal, the people that kill, the people that uh, assault, the people that, you know, do these things that we uh, obviously don't want happening in any kind of modicum of society. How would they be dealt with? That's the question. Okay, okay. All right, so so how – okay, so, so let's, let, let's say the, the, the basic crimes, you know, like, uh, like theft, uh, theft, assault, rape, murder, right? Um, I mean, in a you know, talking about um, a free society, um, it's it's a little bit difficult because it's all speculation, you know, and and that's kind of it gets you know all mangled up and it's what people you know think would happen and you can't no way to prove that and everything. But but um, but you know what I tell people is you know right now you know what we have is a system based on retribution or vengeance or revenge, right? It's always it's always it's like an eye for an eye, right? It's punishing. Punishing the offender rather than making the victim whole if you can make them victim whole, right? If, if you're talking about anything other than murder, you can more or less make the victim whole, you know, days lost from work, uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, um, money lost from not working or, or emotional, you know, damages or medical expenses or things like that, right? In, inconveniencing. So, so there's ways to make the victim whole, but, you know, murder would be a little bit difficult. You know, you'd have to assign some kind of monetary um, amount to that, to, it's just, which kind of turns people's stomachs. Like, how can you assign a monetary value to a human life, right? But in some ways, that would be how the market would have to more or less compensate the victim's family, right? So in our in our society, it's retribution, and not only that, but the people that let's say a murder, right? The people that survive, uh, or, or the family of the murdered murdered person, actually are punished in addition to that because they're with their money, they're they're you know providing the murderer with you know food clothing housing shelter <laughs> security <laughs> right taking care of him for the rest of his life in what would be a socialist utopia known as prison right <laughs> um so that is that is yeah, you uh, get your free college education in in, in prison duh exactly. full, full employment you know yeah you know, all these all these <laughs> college kids you know all these college kids that i say oh you know i wish somebody would pay for my college i'm like dude easy just go go to the gas station walk in there with a bat and start swinging it around you might have to break a few eggs and then you go to prison for assaulted robbery or uh, assault with a deadly weapon and robbery armed robbery so then you're in there for 15 years you could knock out five or six degrees come out a smart man 
I mean, you may, you may have to suffer some rape, but that's besides the point. <laughs> hey, you might even be into that sort of thing. Who knows? But you're, you're, you're still getting a benefit, so you know you can ignore that, just like they do with every other bad thing that they can ignore it because of the benefits. <laughs> yeah, you could go get you could go get three uh three hots and a cot and and study up and you know when you get out you could be a lawyer. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, but like uh, the best thing I've, I think I've heard, I can't remember if it was David Freeman or not. I could be wrong on this, but he said, you know, like, okay, you kill me or and my family takes you to arbitration or they capture you. What's to stop them from killing you there immediately? Like, let's say there's an eyewitness and they caught you. And they kill you, right? You know, you, you let someone know, hey, this guy killed my brother. I'm going to kill him now. Uh, or, or, you know, because I don't think anyone would – anyone has any qualms with that because if there's a killer loose, they need to be dealt with, right? Like – I'm not saying that it needs to be the Wild West out there, but actions have repercussions. But let's say someone stole from you. either They either owe you the property back with, with uh, compensation, or they could, you could, uh, l- let's say they worked somewhere, you could work out a thing with their employer. Look, this person's a thief. I want their next paycheck issued to me. They're not getting it. And then if not, that person, that, that employer is, it's all about reputation. They're gainfully employing a thief. So people are going to boycott or not want to shop there. Like, hey, that guy's an asshole. He, he hires thieves and supports them, you know, and, uh, indenturement is, is another thing. Indenturement for sure is another thing. Someone, you know, there could be private prisons where those private prisons organize the prisoners to do work. Those prisoners get paid, but you get the money due to uh, them owing you compensation for damages, property damages, or bodily harm, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that, you know, the private prison could take the contract out on that person. And if an arbitrator, you know, a private arbitrator that both parties agree upon decides that that's just, then that person willingly entered that contract. So there's a, there's a million ways to skin a cat here. But you got to just follow common sense. Anything you'd like to add, Jeremy? I feel the same way, like Danilo said, that you know it comes down to the whole retribution versus restitution thing, and the you know the mar- the market will provide for that. This is usually attached to the the notion that anarchy actually equals chaos, and that you know by saying you don't want the current police means you don't want any any policing and you want um you want no rules and and and, and no laws um but that's just that's just simply not the case because again people are going to want to be safe people you know just because even if even if the majority ended up believing that you know voluntary actions were the, were the best way to go and 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 this becomes a reality um, those people are still going to want to be kept safe to a certain extent, you know, because with freedom does come responsibility and you need to protect yourself and, you know, and or your family um, and anybody else you, you pull within your circle that, that, you know, you make a, some, some kind of contract or another with to uh, provide for. Um, you're you're going to want to make sure all those and your assets stay safe. So people aren't going to want real criminals that are actually committing actual acts of aggression against other people rather than what we have now where it's you know so many arbitrary edicts are based on victimless crimes or the the the, the so-called victim is society which is just ludicrous um society crimes cannot... against the state yeah <laughs> yeah because that's what it is they say society and people believe the whole we are the government rhetoric so they believe they're talking about them no but who is when when you see those court cases who is the uh who is the plaintiff it's the state <laughs> the state um or the locality whoever you know whoever you're actually dealing with that's the uh, that's the plaintiff in the action if they're taking action against you um or even if you're taking even if you're taking action against somebody somebody else um or you know you are the defendant you are also t- it's also the state <laughs> so it's not society it's 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 the state that that is trying to protect itself um, so you take that out of the equation and you open it up to um, private private security companies who would in turn monitor for real crimes and then it could go any number of ways just like you said Dave um, I also think the whole 
you know, indentured servitude thing actually makes sense too, um, because that that that's a way for them to pay off and try try to make whole. Because uh, you know, Danilo, you, you said that earlier about making them whole. Um, you know, even even in certain cases, it's impossible. Even short of murder, it is impossible to make them whole. But you you would try to make them as close as possible, so you don't end up paying for it paying for their well yeah and also the the person could be a taxation but also the person could be a pacifist let's say let's say someone's a complete pacifist right they would never do harm in any retribution or anything like that and you walk up and shoot them in the head and their family wants to sue you but that person said look i never want anyone prosecuted on my behalf for anything they've ever done to me so like that person could just get away for it for free in a free society now a lot of society could say i'm not associating with that guy because he's a murderer and they could kick him out of their 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 town, their city, whatnot. They could say, "Hey, you're just not welcome here." And if you come on these, this 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 private property, you will be dealt with accordingly. Uh, so it's <clears throat> it's one of those things. What will you do about criminals? <laughs> you know. And, and I know we say that a lot, but it is an individual thing. Stop thinking that daddy's gonna fix the issue. <laughs> You've got to stand up and assert yourself sometimes. And if somebody's threatening your life, you have to you have you know, threats must be met with equal uh, force, in my opinion. So if your neighbor's threatening to kill you, you really don't have many options other than to defend yourself or, uh, you know, find, find a peaceful resol- resolution in this, in this situation. But I don't think any of us are anti-police. I think a lot of us are anti-law enforcement officers. And police and law enforcement officer are really not the same thing. Uh, police are used to be peace officers. They would patrol the areas, make sure no one's getting their ass beat or someone's not getting shit uh, killed or someone's not getting raped or, or stolen from. And and, and that they did they did protecting of property, but ever since they, uh, you know, we, things that we, we should mention the Viper Company in Detroit that 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 arose after. Uh... You know, Detroit basically collapsed, and all the uh, all the tax cows left. And uh, <laughs> but some some people stayed, and and they still they want. And, and also the police, you know, there's no there's no law enforcement officers, you know, at all. So there's still a demand for security, right? And then these people stepped in with their Viper company, providing private security, private uh, private security to these businesses who pay for it, and and with amazing results, you know. And that's a beautiful example of uh, of the market responding to demand. <laughs> For right. sure. Let's so let's move on to our next question. We're going to try to knock these out real quick because we've got the podcast coming up after this and our guest is finally home. So uh, next question is how would poor people get an education? Now, I know we could talk about this for hours, but let's try to condense this down into the ludicrous notion that it is because an education, being taught something and teaching someone something and educating them are two different things. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, we call them teacher. We shouldn't call them teacher. We should call them educators because all they're doing is making sure that they're being taught what they're supposed to be and told to be taught, you know? So I think Jeremy's first on this one or Denise, I can't remember. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, again, in this situation, what's being done now is, is atrocious because the, the public schools that most poor, you know, quote unquote, poor children are, are forced into, uh, are a nightmare. Um, you know, so again, you know, you, you talk about the, the, the hypothetical, cause again, we, we, we don't necessarily have the answers, but you could see how this would go. And, and actually this is something that there is a, a per, currently a, a real world example of to show. Um, there's a book by, uh, James Tooley called the beautiful tree. Um, and it talks about how he went to India to, he, I think, believe he was working for the World Bank and he was doing research for them and he was supposed to be doing research on the private schools in India. And he became disheartened knowing that India is, you know, the, the major part of India, India is extremely poor. Um, and he didn't think that he was helping at all. And then he ended up stumbling into the slums and he came upon these extremely low cost private schools that were hidden in the hidden in the slums that not not many people knew about that were completely parent funded and they were the kids were flourishing in these like he had he has this whole study on it and it's 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 amazing 
that these kids, because the parents, like, you know, a lot of uh, conservatives uh, who are anti-public education um, or the libertarians that are anti-publication, you know, they talk about school choice and, 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 and bringing it down to, to the to local level. Um, you know, I, I dealt with that with the, the Common Core um, crowd, the, the anti-Common Core crowd before I, before I finally gave up on statism altogether. Um, you know, they were all about local, 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 but this is literally taking it to the smallest possible local level. You, the parents are literally involved. They're the ones paying for it. And they have the vested interest in, in making their, in giving their children the best possible education. And they find ways to make it work. And these kids are doing amazing. And they're, you know, some of them are starting to outpace the other, you know, they'd outpace the public schools, they outpace the private schools, the, you know, the higher end ones that, that uh, Thule was originally sent to research. Um, so that right there is a real world example of what can happen if government gets out of the way. Uh, you know, that is the market providing. That is, we need to educate our kids. The government is not providing for us. We are literally going to take it into, into our own hands and, you know, get teachers and there's teachers there's teachers that, that go there and teach for free um you know pe people from around the world are coming in and, and provide you know you mean people aren't you mean all people aren't evil and there's charitable people out there yeah so i don't i don't believe it man yeah. my, bi my bible told me that everyone's evil <laughs> yeah of course <laughs> well I I'm just saying, am am I pastor too? This is this is Dave the Bible Thumper's perspective. Am I pastor too? Are you saying that two sources of information are wrong? D Dave's alter ego, Bible Thumper Dave. Um, <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> so 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 that is right there. Like I said, a real world example of what could be done. Um, and you actually mentioned the word charity. That's the other thing. Like people forget that before government became the forced. Uh, you know, monopoly on cha on, on so-called charities um, because they they even heavily heavily regulate the supposed uh, private ones, so they still have their hand in everything. Um, private charities provided a lot of services. Um, they could just as easily do it for education if it came down to it. You know, and because as you pointed out, Dave, not everybody is evil. There are people that would willingly contribute. You know, there's plenty of people that say they are happy to pay their school taxes even though they've never had kids in the school system. Um, those type of people exist. So in a free society, they would still exist and they'd be more than happy to pay in a little bit, um, even if it's voluntary. I don't know. I really need that gun to my head, man. I, you know, mm, I don't know. <laughs> so, so to me, this is another example of a, of a false dichotomy and um, any appeal to antiquity together because, uh, you know, false dichotomy in that if the state doesn't educate, quote, educate, but I wouldn't even call that education because <laughs> education to me seems a little more voluntary, whereas, you know, when you force kids to go into a particular institution for 12 years of their, the most impressionable years of their lives, to learn useless, worthless information that after they leave those 12 years, they can barely hold down a minimum wage job. That to me sounds more like indoctrination <laughs> than anything else. Government funded uh, taxpayer or government funded taxpayer farms is what they are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, it, it, just imagine if you devote 12 years of your life to any discipline how much of a master would you be at that you know particular discipline 12 years that's a massive amount of time you'd be master at multiple disciplines if you had that amount of time but uh, you know so 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 there's that there's the appeal to antiquity that you know you know kids for the you know for the memory of the recent generations that you know there's always been a public education so that's the only way to educate kids and if they don't go to public education you must hate you must hate learning you must hate mathematics science re reading writing <laughs> <laughs> you might you must you must hate learning new things, right? <laughs> yeah, think about the the economic havoc it causes. And I know this is going to rustle some jimmies, but think about the net economic havoc that it caused to like all the Midwestern farmers to take their kids, put them in public school for those amount of hours a day instead of teaching them how to farm what most likely they're going to do for their whole life and be a better farmer and putting them in farming schools like to be a better farmer that might not be what every individual kid wants to do with their life and they could express that to their parents but you know a lot of people want to do what their father did or their mother did and i i know that i know that to be true and uh you know a lot of people don't want to do what their father and their mother did they want to do something else with their life so the free market would provide those opportunities you know and 
confisc con confiscating your kids and dumping them in a, a prison-like environment with other people that they don't know, uh, shouldn't know really, and force-feeding them propagandized indoctrination is not helping humanity at all, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, and before we go on to the next question, I want to say that what you said about the farmers, to me, that's the, the seen versus the unseen principle. Like people tell me, you know, look at you. You went to public school and you turned out okay. <laughs> well, well, you have no idea how I would have turned out if I would have been able to follow and pursue the passions that I was actually interested in and that would likely have have you know you know led to me doing things we have no idea <laughs> you that, know, like, may, that, that argument is stupid because like a lot of AIDS patients die but some of them live 30 years some of them live five years <laughs> just because something just because there's an abnormality in the situation doesn't make the, the situation any better or worse yeah yeah and just and and uh, and you know forcing people to do things is at the direct expense of of them, you know, voluntarily pursuing their passions, and you really have no idea what creations, what inventions that they would come up with that would, you know, significantly increase the standard of living of humanity <laughs> that you have just destroyed because you think they should know information that, you know, a, a bunch of bureaucrats think it's it's necessary for everybody collectively to know. So welfare parasites as well. The 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 political class is a welfare class. So oh yeah. I, a lot of people don't. Uh, all right, this is a, a big one, uh, and I, I really just want, kind of want to do like three minutes on this because we could do a whole episode on this. Uh, Danilo's going first on this oh. last one here. So, anarchy has never existed. Now, this question is so full of, uh, like, what they think. Like, whenever someone says that, they, they think they know the truth, but they, they don't, like... It's one of those things where you can't really prove that anarchy has ever existed in, in a certain area. Like, most kingdoms were almost anarchistic at, in a sense because the king couldn't afford to police and control the whole area. Like, everything you do in your everyday life that doesn't involve government is anarchy. So, your thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was going to say, yeah, I mentioned that, the very uh, idea that, you know how much of our daily lives is is governed by our own decisions by ourselves you know by our um free will you know what time you what time you wake up in the morning what you know which job you want to you want to work in or what business you want to open or you know what do you want to wear or who do you want to date you know you know all these things there is no laws for that and lo and behold there's no chaos <laughs> and there's no disorder and, uh, and apocalypse that uh, that we can see <laughs> um, but whenever you you implement you know laws and regulations and taxes into people's lives that interferes with that free will um, that's usually when you get um, all of that disorder so so when people say anarchy is chaos I, I like you know I would I would rather say no statism is chaos <laughs> Anarchy is order, right? Anarchy is the spontaneous order that we all um, strive towards. Because why? And this goes back to the uh, the criminal idea of you know how would criminals be dealt with? Because because um, chaos or let's say violence and disorder is expensive, right? It's not cheap to be violent, right? Maybe in our twisted, perverted fiat currency central banking world, it's cheap. So it's it seems. It seems to be cheap because the the cost of the of the war and the death and the destruction has been passed on to future generations, right? At the it's it, it's at the expense of the productivity of the future generations, so that we can live today with all of this genocide, right? So so you know it, it's very expensive to engage in violence, right? So so that's why people always tend towards spontaneous order, like 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 you know in in certain um, you know you've seen those videos of uh, in certain Asian, Asian countries where they remove the, uh, you know, there's no, uh, what do you call that, um, traffic lights, right? <laughs> you see these crazy intersections, right? People walking across these, and, it, and the car is stopping. It's, it's, it, it, looks like, it looks like an amazingly efficient organism. If you step back, you know, it's like, 
It's like everything is working out perfectly. You know, there's no accidents. It's just, it's just, it's just. Uh, I, I love it. <laughs> I love seeing things like that. You know. Oh, surprise! We don't need stoplights and you know and uh, and stop signs and yield signs and you know the funniest thing. I, I was driving today. The funniest thing got me thinking about this. I was driving, you know, you know, in those um, slow mall complexes where you're driving really slow because there's stores on either side and people crossing the street, right? And then you have the sign that says, you, um, "Cars must yield to pass uh, to to passerby." You know, you know, people pedestrian walking, pedestrians by law, by state law, <laughs> cars must yield. And I'm like, I'm like, so what? If if there was no law, people are just gonna run over. Like, <laughs> whoops, sorry. <laughs> boop, 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 boop. Whoops. <laughs> Not my problem. <laughs> it's like, it's like the reason that people aren't killing people at pedestrians is because there's a state law sign that says that. I don't think so. <laughs> you must breathe air. It's the law. It's the law. <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> so, so what would you say, Jeremy? What would you add to that? Um, well, yeah, the there have been examples. Um, I mean, as you said, just the the everyday life, people don't realize that, but. You know, when people are looking for that, a lot they'll demand for you know historical examples, and there actually are. If you go to Wikipedia and search historical uh, examples of anarchy, there's a list of like a couple hundred, I think, <laughs> um, or more over over the centuries um, that had some component, you know, or or another. Um, although I I usually find when I have this objection thrown at me, you know, the first thing I say is, well just because you can't point to one doesn't mean it doesn't you know it can exist um it just hasn't been able to be formed because we've been dealing with you know we have 5000 plus years of recorded history and there's been you know a state in one form or the other <laughs> through most of that time well yeah um, lack of evidence doesn't disprove an assertion yeah that yeah, yeah. you need you need more than that exactly is, is um, that the appeal the appeal to ignorance right because yes. i can't conceive of it it, it can't possibly exist yeah so there are examples, though, if, if people want to be pointed to that, you know, uh, Tom Woods does a, a great there's a great little video that he does with uh, Gerard Casey uh, about Ireland. Uh, okay. I believe the title is uh, Ireland Stateland, Stateless, uh, Stateless for 2000 years. Um, and there's examples in there of, you know, little communities and, and little sections of people working together voluntarily and making things work. Um, you know, there's there's a history in Iceland of of anarchic societies. Um, you know, there was one. Uh, what is it? Uh, I forget the name of it, but it was somewhere from like 900 to 1250 or somewhere in that Are you neighborhood. Talking about Ireland or, or no, that Iceland. I I I, I, oh, okay. I, I was talking about Iceland. Um, but the, the Iceland has a history of it. There's there's more than that, but there was one that was, you know, 300 years. And I, I, there's a lot of things I've read on it that have all said the reason that it actually ended up failing is because it's not it wasn't anarchic enough. Um, they ended up implementing too many rules and laws, and st certain people started getting to power, and that's why it ended up collapsing. Um, you know, and also to even push back a little something that Dave you actually said on a, a couple of questions ago about the Wild West. That's actually a uh, a misconception. Uh, that people have been forced th fed through their indoctrination, which also ties back into the yeah, last question yeah, about yeah. schooling. More, more um, people the, die in Chicago in like a month than than I think uh, is recorded in uh, the yeah, Wild West. Yeah, the uh, the the wild the the so-called Wild West actually was not that wild, and it was a lot more of a voluntary society until the until the federal government finally pushed its way out there and started implementing its policies and went to war against the Indians um, before that people were getting along just fine they 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 understood and learned how to protect each other's property rights and respect each other's property rights um, and they function you know they had their own private sheriffs in a lot of cases but people respected each other because most people were armed and that is actually where that adage you know an armed polite, polite uh, society is a polite society comes from um because it you know that was it was it was proven out there but since then it's been that's been swept under the rug and this the hollywood image of the wild west and uh all the gunslingers um is all people know about and they don't realize they, they don't realize that in the timeline before government got out there and messed it up with you know sticking its hands and everything um and starting and starting wars and slaughtering you know hundreds and, and hundreds of indians um and driving them off the land that they had they had first <laughs> talk yeah. about respecting property rights yeah. um but that's you know that's that's when things went badly so you know even there you have an example of it so there are examples of it 
And but what I usually say to that when that objection is presented to me is that it's really even looking at those is kind of an, of an apples and to orange uh, comparison because since then, since all these attempts, you know, even you look at uh, what is it, uh, Catalonia in, in Spain um, in the early nineteen hundred in the early nineteenth century, right? Was that what it was? Um, the uh, or no, the early twentieth century. Um, you know, it lasted for a short time, but these things have existed. But even the most recent ones are no comparison to what could occur in a society like ours already is with the technological advancements and the, the advancements in human consciousness, you know, since these were tried before, it's a whole new ball game, you know, with the rapid transfer of information um, and people being able to learn so much more, so much more quickly, if they choose to, you know, the, the possibilities are endless. So, yeah, to even, for sure. so to even compare it to these his historical examples, because, you know, when you bring these to people's attentions who have this objection, um, all they'll try to do is poke holes in those societies. And it's like, OK, yeah, it wasn't perfected. But a lot of them will also try to use the same argument that the, you know, that they believe in the Constitution because it was the best thing created, even though it not wasn't necessarily perfected. Okay. I ask him what what which constitution are you referring to the the North North yeah. uh, Viet <laughs> the one. North Korean Constitution the Russian Constitution the Chinese okay. Constitution we, we, which one are you talking about here yeah. um, so, but so let's, exactly. let's 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 wrap this up my my normal uh, response to when someone says uh, you know anarchy has never existed I say uh, show me one example of limited government existing show me one example of communism existing show me one example of true fascism existing uh, spoiler alert they can't they won't uh but true voluntary society has never been tried um without the silly belief in authority and that's not going to happen if people still believe that there needs to be an authority in their life driving their actions whether or not it's a light a light-handed authority or a heavy-handed authority but uh we really appreciate you guys listening to wait, this wait, wait, let me just let me just ra wrap up with a with a quote by charles bukowski you just reminded me of, he said um you know if a, if a law is um is acceptable I'll, I'll tolerate it and if a law is unacceptable i break it <laughs> he, al he also said sort of every, paraphrasing we can find that but I, he, I really he also like... said every answer can be found at the bottom of a bottle <laughs> <laughs> Bukowski was a crazy mofo so. uh, but yeah we really appreciate you listening to this thank you for the quote Danilo thank you for uh, joining us Jeremy uh, uh, if you have any more questions you want us to answer put it in the comments below uh, really appreciate uh, you um, keeping up with this and, and putting comments on our videos or Facebook or wherever this is posted uh, you can check out all of our other content at theseedsofliberty.com and thank you for watching. Bye. Take care. Peace.